Hey folks, let's begin. We're, welcome to the second last optics lecture. Uh, it's about Jones vectors and this amazing mathematical formulization we're going to use for polarization. Guys, at the back. Thanks. <clears throat> Last time we returned to vectors, the vector nature of electromagnetic radiation and thus the vector nature of light. We looked at the relationship between the wave vector k, which way it's going, um, and the electric and magnetic fields. We found they made an orthogonal coordinate system. We also took our generalization and said it doesn't matter uh, which particular direction it is, let's just call the wave vectors propagation z, and that allows us to write the electric field vector as a sum of these two orthogonal components. We don't need a third one because um, light is a transverse wave, so it only has electric field components uh, transverse to the propagation direction. Because the light is monochromatic, we can then substitute in specific functions for the electric field component along x as a function of z and t, and the electric field component along y as a function of z and t. <clears throat> We've got these expressions, and we wanted to think about what the dials in these equations are. Well, for a given wavelength, the wave vector, its modulus, and the angular frequency omega are fixed. And a state of polarization is going to be defined, or at least categorized, by the curve that the tip of the electric field vector makes as it propagates through space and time. And we can choose to do this in a number of ways. We can choose to fix z and vary t, or fix t and vary z. And the polarization state is literally just dictated by the shape that the, curve, the vector traces out. It also bears repeating that the only remaining variables in this set of equations for the electric field components um, are these three here. The amplitude, the real amplitude along x, the real amplitude along y, and the relative phase epsilon. These are our three dials that we get to play with to change the nature of um, light polarization. I'm going to return to what we discussed last time in lecture nine, which is the notion of um, uh, handedness of polarization when it has some circularity. And um, there is this uh, question about what do we mean by grabbing helixes and how do we know which way the electric field's rotating? This example is a good one. Um, if we fix uh, time and vary z, you can see that the electric field vectors are rotating around the axis in a way that makes a right-handed rotation. That's why I call this a right-handed helix. And we identify this with right-handed circular. That's not the only way to define it, but it's the way that I like to remember it. The slightly counterintuitive thing here is that if we fix um, z and vary time, like looking at the vector in this plane, it traces out a circle that's going clockwise, which we would kind of think is a, a left-handed rotation in a right-handed coordinate system. But this contention exists because of the nature of the um, electromagnetic waves phase. The phase changes, um, it increases with increasing z, and it, incre it decreases with increasing time. So we have this contention. It's natural. It causes some confusion, but there's nothing we can do about it. There is um, another question, which is, how did I know that uh, for a particular electric field like this, which way the vector is going to go? And it's really easy to show. Uh, we're going to do a little simulation now, um, which just reminds you how parametric functions work. Because when I say that we want to know which way the tip of the electric field vector traces out, what I'm actually talking about there is making a parametric plot. Let's make a parametric plot of the electric field vector for um, those functions that I just showed. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to set z to be 0 and omega to be 1, which means that my electric field is really simple. It's just that. The parameter here is time, and I'm going to vary it from 0 to 2 pi. And it's a circle. Well, that's good. We thought that this state was a circularly polarized state, but it doesn't actually tell us which way the electric field's going, where the tip of the electric field vector is. So to make that actually happen, we need to, of course, animate this entire expression and change um, how long we uh, plot for. Let's plot up to some time, capital T, and make that variable go from uh, 0 0.01, so the plot doesn't break, up to 2 pi. 
whoa, that's looking pretty gnarly because I haven't uh, done what I always encourage you to do. When you're making an animation like this, you need to fix the plot range. So upon doing that, we'll make this go from negative 1.1 uh, to 1.1. Now we can see that um, this is indeed a circle that's being traced out by some vector and it's going in the clockwise direction. So we're sitting in that plane at z equals zero, we're letting time evolve and the vector's tracing out a circle. Halfway there, I didn't actually draw the vector. That's easy to do as well. Uh, I just have to add an arrow to the plot using the Mathematica function epilogue. An arrow takes two arguments, the, um, the, the tail of the vector, which is going to be at the origin, and the tip, which is going to be at um, cos of negative big T, sine of negative big T. Awesome. So this is how I made those um, 2 and 3D visualizations on Moodle. And it's also how I checked that um, the handedness of this polarization state um, was correct. Because like I said, it's so confusing that I have to remind myself every year. But we have the technology to figure it out for ourselves. If we were to um, add a phase of, <coughs> I don't know, uh, pi here, the electric field will go in the other direction. And this would be the case of, um, of left-handed circularly polarized light. <clears throat> so um, you can use the more sophisticated version for yourself. Uh, the one that's on Moodle has um, all sorts of different states, not just uh, linear and circular, but also um, elliptical as well. And I've plotted the, um, the magnetic field to show you that it exists as a thing, but we often suppress it because it immediately depends on the electric field. Okay, so um, any other questions about this strange convention? Excellent. I was impressed that you all um, identified um, which handedness I had for that elliptical state last time. So it's the relative amplitude and the relative phase of the orthogonal field components that determine uh, a polarization state. And if we even be more restrictive and make the relative amplitudes uh, one and only change the relative phase, it turns out that is sufficient to get all the different shapes of elliptical polarization. So all the ellipticities, all the way from linear through to circular, elliptical and back to linear again. We don't get every single polarization state, of course, because you can see that these all have a, a common axis, which is um, plus 45 degrees or minus 45 degrees. But this is a way to generate all pure polarization states up to a rotation. <clears throat> what do we mean by pure polarization? That is a vexed question. Uh, Hecht will tell you some things about oscillators being in phase. Um, there's no real good classical theory of impure polarization. You really need to look at the quantum treatment um, of quantum optics and um, coherence to understand what it means for a polarization state to be uh, impure. Um, and once you start having to invoke these notions of a source that's jiggling out of phase with another thing, um, that's beyond what we kind of care about here. We care about classifying uh, polarization of classical waves as best we can without learning about the light matter interaction or where the, where the light came from. So we won't talk too much um, about impure polarization. What about intensity? Well, this is, again, somewhat of an orthogonal issue to polarization itself. Making the wave brighter doesn't change the nature of the polarization state. <clears throat> There's also a terminology thing here, and that is that all polarization states are strictly elliptical. It's just that some ellipses are skinnier than others. So this straight line is, technically speaking, an ellipse. But of course, we, um, we generally mean, when we say elliptical, that it's neither circular nor linear. Another question um, I had, which uh, is a good one, is how does this handedness change when we go uh, through this uh, angle of uh, pi on 4? Well, what happens between um, going from a, a wave that has a handedness that um, looks like this is left-handed, and then all of a sudden it becomes right-handed? Um, well, again, you can use the simulation um, to figure this out for yourself uh, if this actually wants to work. Let's try and make it work.
So here, I want to see that the wave goes. Oh, that's not really working that well. We could actually probably try it with, um, with the Mathematica demo, I reckon. So let's um, now change the phase here. We need to make um, one change to the relative phase. I am going to do something I've never done before and try and wrap and animate in a manipulate. Wish me luck. Thanks. So we're going to make this um, epsilon go from um, 0 to pi. That should be enough to see something interesting. All right. I will need to also make my wave here. Uh, come on, Mathematica. I'm sorry? Thank you. That's great. Thanks, guys. OK, so we've got this um, plane at z equals 0, and the electric field's going back and forth in time. Now let's change epsilon a bit to make some angle. Awesome. This is going counterclockwise, so it's a left-handed um, handedness. We'll increase this a bit more. It's looking pretty trippy. Still left-handed until we get to this um, point where it's linear again. And here's the magic bit. I have to actually increase that to 2 pi. So we're going to go through this point where it's all left-handed. We get back to linear. Whoa. Spoiler alert. And then, all of a sudden, it changes direction. So this will be um, a cinematic tour de force if we can play both of these at the same time. That doesn't actually illustrate what I want, but damn, it looks cool. <laughs> Actually, I know how to make it. I know how we can do it. We can speed up the um, we can speed up the internal animate. Yeah. <laughs> Stanley Kubrick, get your heart out. All right. <clears throat> so you can see this for yourself in the interactive polarization demos on Moodle. Those um, different elliptical polarizations we could generate just by changing one of the three variables um, only gave us those um, ellipses that were restricted to being along 45 degrees. We can um, actually figure out the angle of any elliptical state. Its major axis will subtend an angle to the x-axis alpha here. Um, and it's going to be given by uh, this complex um, arctan. You can see it depends on the two real electric field amplitudes, e naught x and e naught y. Um, and epsilon, so it depends on all the dials in our equation, as it should, and um, it reduces to something pretty simple in the case of the electric field amplitudes being equal. It must reduce to either uh, positive 45 degrees or negative 45 degrees. But the point is that for any arbitrary E naught X, E naught Y and epsilon, you can figure out the orientation of this major axis. You can also figure out the um, relative amplitudes or the eccentricity, and that's an exercise for you to do in the final optics tutorial. So we come to this um, probably unsurprising uh, notion that we want to describe polarization by vectors and we want to boss those vectors around with matrices. This is the theme of the course. Um, it's about linear algebra. It's not just something that um, Tim Groney, Tim Groney for life, taught you, but it's also very, very useful in the physical world. So a state vector description is going to um, do this for us. And don't just think that this is limited to um, second year optics. State vectors being used to describe a system and being transformed by matrices are common to heaps of fields. So my field, quantum mechanics, uh, we use this every day. We describe spins in magnetic fields um, with uh, column vectors of complex numbers. And the matrices are the operators that make the system evolve. It also describes the propagation of neutrinos through the Earth. They are spinful particles. They have these things called mass eigenstates. And the mass eigenstates actually change character as the neutrino passes through the Earth, passes straight through us. And this, too, is described by very similar matrix mechanics. Modeling traffic, um, modeling the stock market, and modeling the spread of a virus is all done using a system described by matrices and matrix transforms. This is a very common theme, um, and hopefully you've got a small taste of what it's like from the examples we've done in, um, in this course. So we're going to um, define this thing called a Jones vector. And we had these uh, real electric field vector E here, which was composed of um, real numbers. We're going to say that's equivalent to this um, 
complex representation. Again, just replacing the trigonometry with exponentials um, and taking out a common factor to leave us with these three numbers again, e naught x, e naught y, and epsilon. This is called the Jones vector. And yes, yeah, since the polarization only depends on the relative phase, we can pull out a common phase factor 5x arbitrarily. So these numbers are all real, and when we compose them in this Jones vector, we make sure that we don't get it confused with the real electric field vector by putting a tilde on the top of the E uh, instead of an arrow. So this E tilde is what we're going to use as the Jones vector. You'll notice that it doesn't have any of the um, spatio-temporal dependence anymore. It's a very concise formal, formal description um, for a polarization state. So let's look at an example, um, going from the real representation to something complex. Uh, and we'll start with circular polarization. So the real representation of um, circular polarization we kind of just looked at, we plotted it in Mathematica. These x and y are just unit vectors along the x and y axis. Phi is the spatiotemporal phase. And I've chosen two signs here. The sign plus corresponds to right-handed and minus corresponds to left-handed. That's what we figured out with that animation. Because I'm trying to convert this into um, the real part of a complex number, I want to turn that sign into a cos. That's the first task I have to do to this expression. To do that, for the two different signs, plus or minus, I have to uh, first subtract and then plus a phase of pi on 2. If that's not familiar to you, um, again, you can figure this out for yourself. Uh, if it uh, is challenging you, then I suggest you um, Netflix and chill with the unit circle. Now we're ready to write this down as the real part of some complex number. So far, we're just writing down the real electric field amplitude in different ways. But now we're ready to um, go into the complex domain by saying that this whole thing is going to be equal to the Jones vector. So what's it equal to? We take out a common factor of E0, E to the I phi, and we've got a column vector of two complex numbers. The first one's 1, and the second one is E to the... Uh, minus plus i pi on 2. We can simplify that one more step. And it's 1 minus or plus i. <clears throat> so that allows us to uh, write down the two different polarization states. Because the overall amplitude and phase don't really change the nature of polarization, we sometimes um, take that out as a uh, constant and absorb that into these simpler terms. This one's the Jones vector for right-handed circular polarized light. And this one's the Jones vector for left-hand, oops, circularly polarized light. So this is a really nice way to get rid of all the spatio-temporal dependence and the trigonometric functions once more. Okay, if we took these two things and added them together, we'd get another animal that is a Jones vector. Jones vectors are complex vectors. The two elements have the same units, and that means we can um, add them together. They're closed under addition. Let's add these two together. Two times one zero, the basis vector one zero. We can identify that with linearly polarized light along the horizontal direction. So 
So that is just that one. And these little cartoons I'm drawing with arrows on both ends or uh, circles with arrows on both ends, uh, they're just a concise way of describing that shape that the electric field vector traces out in time. <clears throat> Begs the question, how can we make opposite circular polarizations be combined to make vertical polarization? We added them together left and right and we got something horizontal. There's another way we can do this and I want you to um, answer this question uh, via this poll. Is the poll open? Can you see it? Hello. Cool. <clears throat> well, people are changing their minds. Didn't even know that was possible. All right. Uh, that's fairly compelling. Uh, you guys are a clever bunch. Let's find out if it is B, or C, B and or C um, and why it's the case. So we'll go back to this slide and we'll do the thing that you said was B and C. Uh, first we will add them together with a phase of pi. Doesn't matter which way I define this phase of pi but I'll uh, do it by multiplying by e to the i pi on the left hand circular. That is nothing other than subtracting them because e to the i pi is minus one, one of Feynman's favorite equations. And you can see that this um, will indeed make the horizontal component vanish. It will leave us with a vertical component of negative two i and we can take the negative i out, negative 2i out the front actually and write that as 0, 1, which is uh, vertical polarization. <clears throat> so adding these up in different ways can give us um, different types of polarization. This kind of um, hints at the idea of orthogonality that it doesn't uh, we don't have to choose horizontal and linear as an orthogonal set of Jones vectors to make a coordinate system or a basis. We can do this in uh, a number of ways. And when you're making a set of basis states, uh, crucial is this idea of Jones vectors that are orthogonal. And uh, here, what do we mean by orthogonality? Well, it's a complex vector space. So just like in quantum mechanics, we have to define a, no uh, sorry, a dot product, a way we can take two vectors and get a scalar out. Um, and we want that scalar to be our uh, something that is related to the, the norm of one of them. So we define this complex conjugate and dot E1 with the conjugate of E2. That's our dot product in this complex space. And we'll take an example which isn't so complex. Uh, firstly, we'll take a look at our linear polarization. So in this case, we have, oh, sorry, I'll have to just close this, keep. Slow show. So linear polarization will have uh, horizontal is going to look like this. Vertical is 0, 1. And this one's really simple. E1 dot E2 star is just 1, 0 dotted with 0, 1. That's too simple. So let's make it a little bit harder. We'll try the case where we actually have some complex numbers to conjugate. So for circular polarization, we will uh, dot the right-handed circular Jones vector with the left-handed one. And remember when doing so, we have to um, do that conjugation which only changes the sign of 
the um, vertical component. So that's 1 squared plus negative i squared, which is 1 minus 1 equals 0. So indeed, there are, um, there's always a unique Jones vector that's orthogonal to, the, to any vector you're looking at. Those are the two kind of simplest examples, but you can prove this uniqueness uh, to an extent. And um, there's an example in your notes, which is to find the Jones vector that's orthogonal to this elliptical polarization state. So this is, um, how do I know this is elliptical? Well, it's not linear because it doesn't have a relative phase of zero. The relative phase here is pi on two. And it's not circular because that would require equal electric field amplitudes along the x and y directions. Here, the relative amplitude is two. The modulus of this number is twice as big as the modulus of this number. So this is definitely a state that's neither linear nor uh, circular. Um, nevertheless, it has an elliptical state that is orthogonal to it. Let's try and find out what that is. The equation is a dot b star equals zero, but we're trying to solve for b. So the first thing we'll do is take the conjugate of um, both sides of that equation. And that'll tell us that um, a star dot b is also zero. We then want to write um, b in a form that gives us um, three numbers we can figure out the values of. So this is just a complex vector, but I'm missing, it seems like I'm missing a component. I'm missing the imaginary part of the uh, top element. That's okay, because it's only uh, the relative phase that matters. Remember, we can always pull out the relative, uh, some overall phase of a Jones vector, and it will be the equivalent polarization state, which means that we can always make that top element a real number. So alpha, beta, and delta here are all real. And now we just plug and chug. So 2 minus i, that's what the conjugate of a is. I'm going to get minus i times i, which will give me positive delta. Writing this as a sum of real and imaginary parts. This must be zero, and the real and imaginary parts are linearly independent. So I can say that this thing's equal to zero, and so is this thing. This means that uh, beta vanishes, so the real part of the um, y component vanishes. And what do we get from the other equation? 2 alpha plus delta is equal to 0. Looks like we're um, out of luck. We've got three unknowns and two equations. Let's persist anyway and see what actually um, happens. All right. So we're left with this relationship between the imaginary part of the y component and the real part. Um, let's just take an example where alpha was equal to 1. Uh, then we would have the B Jones vector would be equal to uh, 1 and negative 2i. OK, that's just an example of um, one way we can satisfy this equation. But I'm allowed to choose any value of alpha I want. Doing so just scales the Jones vector by a constant. That's just a comment that this orthogonality is not entirely unique. It's unique up to some constant multiplicative factor, which is true of any um, two orthogonal vectors. I can always scale each of them, and they'll still be orthogonal. So that's the, that's the Jones vector that's orthogonal to A. What do they look like? So you can also draw these two states in a number of ways. One of the simplest ways is to identify that um, the relative phase is just pi on 2, which means that it looks like a circularly polarized state that's been stretched along the <coughs> x-axis for that one and the y-axis for that one. And they also have, um, actually, the relative phase is plus pi on 2 here and minus pi on 2 here, 
which also changes their handedness. So those two features, the opposite handedness and the opposite orientation of the um, major axis of this ellipse, can be shown for any two elliptical polarization states. The proof's a little more involved, um, but there's a couple of pages of um, Jones calculus uh, that proves that on Moodle. And because we've just shown that any, two, uh, any polarization state can have an orthogonal counterpart, this means that any uh, state can be expressed as a superposition of those two um, orthogonal states. In the example we um, often take for granted, that's a trivial statement that this Jones vector is equal to a linear combination of 1, 0 and 0, 1. But there's nothing special about those two Jones vectors. I could have equally well chosen left-handed circular and right-handed circular, and I would have just had different coefficients in the linear expansion. There's an exercise in the notes, which is to repeat this process uh, for these two Jones vectors we just looked at, A and B, show that any arbitrary polarization state can be written as a linear combination of those. So we've got this formalism um, down pat now. We've gone through all the details of classifying polarization and bundling up the three numbers into some complex vector. Now let's actually try and figure out how to manipulate this and change the states of polarization with things that we see in nature and things that we make ourselves. So a linear polarizer, which you're all familiar with, changes the state of polarization by just picking out one component of linear polarization. It lets through that linear component um, with uh, no attenuation, and it maximally attenuates the orthogonal component. Uh, this means we have to define a transmission axis, the axis through which all the lights polarization gets through, and the one that's orthogonal will, will give you most attenuation on. You don't need to worry about the details of how this works, although you may have seen an example uh, in the EM1 prac where you have this uh, set of rods that let the electric field oscillate up and down, um, defining the transmission axis for microwaves. There are other examples, um, like the ones we look at in our sunglasses uh, and these films here, that are made of um, iodine crystals in a polymer matrix. They are, of course, much loved by photographers for reducing reflections, uh, and also fishermen. So you get a very distinct um, difference when the polarized light reflecting off water uh, is reduced and it takes away all the glare, lets you see through what you're actually looking at rather than seeing a reflection of the sun. Okay, let's try and put this into our um, formalism of the Jones calculus. And we're going to um, do so by recalling what this uh, physical object does to the polarization vectors. This idea is, again, extremely common to anything involving matrix mechanics. To figure out the matrix operator, for some particular optical element or financial system, you need to evaluate what it does to your basis states. And that's easy for us because we know um, exactly what uh, linear polarizer will do to orthogonal states of, of polarized light. So we're looking to find this matrix that describes a linear polarizer. We're going to call it this uh, nice looking script A. And if the transmission axis is horizontal, we know exactly what that's going to do to horizontally polarize light. It's going to let it through with a coefficient of 1. If the transmission axis was horizontal and we applied this matrix to a vertically polarized Jones vector, we'd get 0 times that Jones vector. It's this trivial action of taking what we know about the op op optical element on the basis states that immediately allows us to write down the matrix for that optical element. This could be quantum mechanics. This could be uh, virus-borne propagation. The protocol is the same. You act on the basis states with some operator, and you take these guys and stick them as column vectors into your operator matrix. So the Jones matrix for this linear polarizer looks like this. It's that simple, ha, huh. except when you um, remember that that's a zero. All right. Similarly, we can figure out the Jones matrix for a vertical polarizer. When it acts on um, horizontal polarized light, it'll give us zero. When it acts on vertically polarized light, it won't change, oops, it won't change the state at all. So hopefully this is um, familiar to you from linear algebra. 
how to construct these matrix representations. Those were really easy because they were really familiar. Now we want to figure out what happens when we actually look at an arbitrary oriented transmission axis. Uh, this is familiar to you from um, this thing called Malice's Law, which you will have used in the Beatles experiment. And um, we uh, know that Hecht has this diagram of um, Malice's Law, which considers natural unpolarized light, two linear polarizers at some angle. I look at this and I just go, why? Why are you doing this in such a complicated way? We're just trying to get to the very simple statement of what happens when you send pure linear polarized light through an arbitrary oriented linear polarizer. So to this diagram, I cross out all that guff and we just care about some um, arbitrary input state to a um, polarizer or a well-defined input state to an arbitrary oriented polarizer. So we're going to simplify this diagram entirely by assuming that we have this um, pure input state impinging upon a linear polarizer oriented at an angle theta. And this is going to mean that we need to know um, something about rotation operators. So if we're going to take our uh, Jones matrices for optical elements and we want to ask the question what happens when we rotate these at arbitrary angles, we will of course need to know um, what rotation operators do in this 2D complex space. Well in this 2D complex space it turns out that we can rotate the operators and matrices with this real rotation matrix R. And this is a rotation matrix for rotating vectors anti-clockwise by an angle theta. There's a few different ways of writing this, but this is the convention we're going to use here. It has the following properties. Its transpose is equal to a rotation in the opposite direction is equal to its inverse. So all these things are the same, uh, which should be unsurprising to you because if I go this way, it's the same as if I... Um, uh, sorry, I can do the inverse of this by just rotating the opposite direction, negative theta. It also preserves the norm of a vector, as any rotation operator should. It shouldn't change the length of the vector, and in this case, uh, the intensity of light. So um, you can show that quite readily. And um, if we actually carry these E0 X and E0 Y around, then the norm of the Jones vector does give us the, um, the overall intensity. Uh, and that is readily showed using the rotation operator. OK, so let's take hex diagram and make it really, really, really simple. We've got this um, original coordinate system x, y. We're going to take vertically polarized light, which has a Jones vector 0, 1. We're going to denote this as uh, Jones vector E in. We've taken our uh, polarizer with a transmission axis that was vertical, and we've rotated it clockwise by theta, viewed with the light coming towards us. And we know that it's only going to let through stuff whose um, polarization is aligned along that transmission axis. But we don't know the amplitude of E out. That's what we're trying to derive. We're trying to figure out Malice's law. So if we just focus on what this red vector looks like, what this red polarization state looks like in the two different coordinate systems, we've now got to figure out how we go from an, exp an expression for the red input polarization state in XY coordinates to a Jones vector expressed in X prime, Y prime coordinates. This is, again, something that I always uh, grapple with. And the reason is that I don't have to remember how to do this. I can figure it out whether it's an anti-clockwise rotation or a clockwise rotation just by looking at this picture, drawing this picture and looking at it. And I want you to have a think about this, uh, what we actually need to do here. So what do we need to do to get the Jones vector, E in, into the rotated coordinate system, X prime, Y prime? It's one of these things. Have a go. The actual rotation and uh, coordinate systems are slightly too transparent there, but you should get the idea. <coughs> I don't mind if you talk amongst yourselves. In fact, you should.
Hmm. All right, this one is um, far more interesting. So um, who said, there's going to be a lot of you, 73%, um, rotate the Jones vector clockwise by theta? Anyone want to fess up to answering that in that 73%? Okay, I'm not going to um, put a Jones vector to your head. Uh, does anyone want to offer why they think the polarization state needs to be rotated instead of the Jones vector? Twelve percent. Someone said it. Okay, you guys are a shy bunch today. Um, you have to participate if you want a prize. I have these cool little magic stripe polarization sets down here. Um, so don't be too shy. We're going to do an exercise in a second where you will have to do something. Um, but this question is uh, is really interesting. Of course, it's going to be one of the two clockwise or anti-clockwise rotations. But first I want to talk about whether what we're actually rotating. And this is more of a conceptual thing. Um, the other answers only differ, the only permutations differ by whether we're rotating the Jones vector coordinates or whether we're rotating the polarization state. Coordinates of our Jones vector, let's look at some examples, are just numbers in a column vector. Right? This number is AX and AY. They're describing some polarization state. But they're not unique. They depend on the basis you've expanded it into. So when the basis of uh, horizontal and vertically polarized light, yeah, it's AX and AY. But the same polarization state has different numbers if you were to express this in a different coordinate system. So you don't need to change a polarization state to get different numbers there. And in fact, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find out how to express the same polarization state in the rotated coordinate system. This is important. We're not changing the input polarization state at all. We're just changing how we write it down in terms of a column vector of two numbers. So it is definitely not um, either B or D. We're not physically changing the polarization state yet. We're just changing how we express it. So in that case, it's going to be um, rotating the Jones vector, which is not the polarization state. It's the polarization state expressed in some coordinate system uh, by the clockwise by theta or anti-clockwise by theta. And here's where I have to um, go back to this diagram and always think about um, which one it is. So in this diagram, you can see that in the unprimed coordinate system, there is no x component of the red vector. It's all y. But think about what its x component is in the primed coordinate system. It's small and negative. And its y component is large, but not as large as it was in the um, unprimed coordinate system. So the fact that we've got a small and negative um, uh, x component and a smaller but still positive y component means that we've done what to the coordinates? We've actually rotated them anti-clockwise. So this is a passive transformation um, by using an anti-clockwise rotation in theta. That's the only way we'd get a small negative component um, in the coordinates x prime, y prime. It's a little confusing, but you have to think about these examples uh, with kind of limiting small cases to um, consolidate what you, um, what you suspect. Uh, and that means actually in our, in our quiz, the correct answer is D. So I've finally stumped you on one of these um, polls. Okay, so now we're going to actually... Um, sorry? Ah, that is true. 24% um, of you know what's up. We're rotating the Jones vector anti-clockwise. It's C. Thank you. All right. We're going to try and derive Malice's law. But first, we should remember what Malice's law is. I'm going to demonstrate Malice's law with my smartphone. Has anyone got any um, sunglasses here today? They want to volunteer for the demo. Yep. Thanks. Great. <clears throat> so here's a protractor. Uh, on my phone. It's actually just an image of a protractor. And um, if I stick these glasses here, I will see some uh, attenuation already. But now let's see what happens when I change the angle. I get full attenuation when they're vertical. Back to the initial intensity here, and then full attenuation again. 
All right, so how, how many uh, degrees did I move the um, glasses through? Well, let's call this, um, let's call this one zero. I've rotated through 90 degrees, I get a null, and back up to 180 degrees, and I get full intensity again. We could do this with a polarizer as well. So starting at, um, with the uh, <clears throat> axis aligned horizontally, I get um, full transmission thereabouts up to the imperfection of this device. I rotate it by 90 degrees and get full attenuation. And then I rotate it again and I get full transmission again. So now I want you to draw, just from this empirical experiment, what the transmission is as a function of rotation angle starting at um, theta equals zero being the case of full transmission. So we're starting there, doing that, and then doing that. So draw down in your book um, what the transmission as a function of theta is. And once you've got a graph of a transmission versus theta, uh, then write down, eyeball the graph and, and write down the expression for it. A well-drawn diagram and the correct expression uh, gets one of these. I have two to give away. And someone thinks they've got um, a graph and an expression, raise your hand and I'll, I'll come and take a look. <clears throat> Joe? Thank you. Anyone else? I do have two of these things to give away. Yes. You know we use these to um, align our laser cooled atom trap. I had the exact same ones. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Just because you've got a whiteboard and these are cool. Okay. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, actually, you've already done it. You even wrote the expression down. Fantastic. Um, we're starting at one. You haven't labelled your one, but yes, I imagine that you've got um, the right number there. Uh, you start at one, go down to zero at pi on two, and back up to one at an angle of pi. That's correct. You can eyeball this and pretty quickly convince yourself it's um, cos squared theta. That's Malice's law. Joe's attempt, she first drew a negative intensity and then realized that was a bit silly. So she squared the whole thing and got I cos squared of theta as well. Um, that is correct as well. So uh, congratulations, guys. You're going to get a set of these. And I'll show you why they're cool in a second. <coughs> there you go. All right. Oops, sorry. I will take a look at these at the end. Thanks for the 3D goggles. But in the interest of time, I do want to show you um, what you can do with cross polarizers. So cross polarizers are great because um, you can uh, firstly, actually I will stick this in and see what happens. You can see stress in certain materials. Uh, hopefully you might be able to see it with this fork. But actually, what's really cool is um, if you just rotate this a little bit, you should be able to see the uh, actual thin film interference from, from this guy. Maybe the document camera is not showing up. There we go. But come back, come up at the end of class and have a close look at this. It's the exact same gradient as the soap bubble. Uh, and I've also got a set of sticky tape that's getting thicker as a function of distance, which also gives us that very familiar um, thin film interference pattern. So have a play with these later. All right, so back to Malice's law. We know what it is from the experiment. Now we're going to try and derive that intensity. So we're going to um, figure out that only the, um, the orange bit gets through. And we're ready to calculate the amplitude of the orange bit. Our job is to take into account the rotated coordinate system that's been moved <laughs> clockwise by theta. 
transmit through what is now a vertical polarizer in the prime coordinate system. That's why we made our life easier. And then we can optionally rotate back to the original coordinate system. This is equivalent to that passive transformation I talked about, which is to rotate the Jones vector anti-clockwise by theta, transmit through a vertical polarizer again, and then rotate the Jones vector back into the unprimed coordinate system by an angle theta. <clears throat> um, when we do that, and we, um, we can figure out what the um, Jones matrix for a rotated polarizer is, uh, but the math is, um, is quite simple. So we've got E in in the xy coordinates is equal to 1, 0. E in in the x prime y prime coordinates is equal to R of negative theta times 1, 0. That's cos of negative theta, negative sine of negative theta, sine of negative theta, cos of negative theta, all acting on 1 and 0. Uh, we know what trig is, so we can write that down as cos theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, and cos theta. And we'll get out uh, a vector that looks like this. Cos theta and negative sine theta. OK. We're now ready to figure out what the output Jones vector is in the prime coordinate system. It's just equal to the vertical polarization uh, polarizer matrix acting on E in in the x prime, y prime coordinates. That is 0, 0, 0, 1. And it completely nukes the horizontal component and leaves us with negative sine theta. And I've screwed something up here, obviously. I didn't start with a vertically polarized state. That was bad. They should be zero ones. Zero one. Zero one, and I'm going to get a different matrix here. <clears throat> I will get sine theta at the top and cos theta at the bottom. That's going to leave me with cos theta, and now I'm ready to calculate the intensity. So the intensity is just the complex norm of that Jones vector in dimensionless units. I on I naught is going to equal E out in the X prime, Y prime coordinates, all squared, and that's cos squared theta. So the hard bit here wasn't doing that manipulation. The hard bit was just figuring out which way to rotate the coordinates. And we can figure that out by taking a simple example, a limiting case of small theta, and um, we just derived Malice's law. <clears throat>